Chance Numbers chapter 33, verse 16. So look, this is not the majority of my of my message, and all, but, but I want you to see this. And they removed from the desert of Sinai and pitched at Kibroth Hakalah. <laughs> I was reading the other morning in the Word of God, and I was like, for some reason, that word just jumped off the page in my heart. Kibroth. So this is where the children of Israel weren't happy with the diet that God was giving them. He was providing them manna from heaven, and he was giving them provision, but they, they, weren't, they weren't happy with it, and they wanted flesh. And God sent quail, and the Bible teaches us that they ate flesh until they vomited out of their nose. And then they were struck with a plague and were buried in a place, and the name of that place was Kibroth Hatamah. It means the graves of the flesh. So before we transition from this spot about flesh, I, I just want to say a little bit more about the fact that the believer, that we all as believers, if we're born again tonight, or you're born again tonight, you don't have to raise your hand. If you are, you don't have to raise your hand if you're not. But I want to tell you that it's really important. I, I've been telling people that, that are in the world, even they'll come into these clinics where I work, and I'm like, mm, you need to really seek this out. You need to, you need to try to understand what I'm, what I'm telling you. Because, see, Jesus had a conversation with a religious leader. And he told him, he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's so important. I'm, like, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm pulling all the stops. I'm pulling all the stops because I feel like the days are growing dark, and I feel like the time is getting short. And I, don't feel, and I feel like there's people that are plunging headlong into a devil's hell. I believe that. And, and, I, and I'm not excited about it. And the Lord's not excited about it either. His heart is grieved. And he desires people to be saved. Amen. It's the will of the Lord that men be saved. Praise God. And, and, and so with that said, you know, whenever you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, most of y'all, I believe you're probably saved. Amen. But when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the, the game changer is the fact that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. That's how a man or a woman knows when they're truly saved. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. The Ephesians 1.13 says you're sealed with the Spirit of God. Amen. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in, he starts changing things. I heard one guy tell me after, you know, after I had, he had heard me preach a couple times, but it was, he said, man, it was like, it was like the Lord was all up in my heart kicking boxes around. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He'll get up in your heart and he'll start kicking boxes around. Okay. He'll start revealing things to you or to myself that are not God's will for our lives. And that's really how you know you've been saved is because the presence of the Holy Spirit moves into your heart and into your life. And not only that, you'll also feel that's really the love of God working on us. Amen. And so I just wanted to first talk about that fact that, that, as a born-again believer, we need to also be spiritually sober to the truth that the flesh remains an ongoing, and hear, hear my words carefully, potential problem for the believer. The flesh remains an ongoing potential problem for the Christian growth throughout the entirety of his journey. All right, Galatians 5.17, if you could put that up in the ESV version of the Bible. Uh, again, just so you know, the reason that I use different versions now is because I'm trying to find the heart of what I believe it explains the best. Okay, so I go through all of them and I compare and I dig. And so in Galatians 5 and 17, I will tell you this. In the ESV version, it uses the word desire. In the King James version, it uses the word lusts. Okay, and that's what we're probably used to. Uh, for the lust of the flesh, okay? But in the ESV, it uses the word desires, and I'll, I'll break that down a little bit here in a second. But I just, I wanted to think for a moment, I wanted to share this with you. I think it's important that you understand that the flesh is connected to your soul. I, I mean, like your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. And I want you to know that your flesh, in some way, is very connected to your soul. And, and what I mean by that is this, and I mean, I don't want to, I'm, I'm getting a little stiff, so I don't know if I should really do it, but let, listen, if your flesh is not animated by your inner man, like, then you know what happens is, is that you're just going to fall, you're going to fall lifeless to the ground because your flesh is nothing but a bag of bones without the spirit life that God has given us as human beings to give, to animate our life. 
And so the, the mixture of the spirit and the soul is the inner man. And whenever you get, whenever you and I die, this inner man is going to leave. The two are connected together. Whenever, whenever you and I die, the two, the, you need to understand, the two are connected together. And when one leaves, the other's leaving along with it, right? And so if your soul is your mind and your will and your emotion, what I need you to understand is that, well, does anybody have a nice watch? Well, you might, I don't know how nice it is, but you know, Mike, if you would just let go ahead and just, just let me go ahead and do this real quick. If you don't mind, sir, I kind of want this watch. I like this watch right here. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to use some old language that I used to use back in the neighborhood. I jacked your watch. <laughs> my flesh jacked your watch. But I didn't just do it in my flesh without my soul being involved in that. My mind wanted to, to, to take your watch. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Like the, the flesh, the flesh is how is how you interface with the through your flesh. Okay, the flesh is how you interface your soul to your external world. I'm, I'm getting technical on you, right? Now, I've never played virtual reality game, but, but that's, how, that's how in a virtual reality game, my understanding would be goggles or different things. We used to have a Wii. Bought the girls a Wii back when they were young, and you could kind of feel it, right? And you could play a tennis game, and, and it has some interaction. Well, so through these kinds of devices, we become interactive with the game, right? So what I'm trying to say is, is that the way that your soul interfaces with the world around you is through your flesh. But it's really the problem is, is in your mind and your will and your emotions. So I'm trying to show you that there's a close connection between your flesh and your mind, right? That's why the Word of God says we need a renewed mind. The Bible says when you get saved, you got the mind of Christ. Amen. But but the reason that we don't that we need a renewed mind is because most of the time Christians aren't operating with the renewed mind of Christ, the mind of Christ that God gave them when they got saved. And there is a process of time where we have to learn the things of God. Amen. And so I wanted you to, I wanted you to know that. So so in, in Galatians five seventeen it says this. It says for the desires of the flesh, and again the King James version uses lust are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So the desires of your flesh, again, this is connected to your old man. Your old, listen, in Christ, I want you to know this. In Christ, the word of God says that when you came into Christ, whether you knew it or not, that the old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus at the cross. Okay, and he was buried with Jesus in the tomb. And that G just as Jesus was resurrected to new life, you too have been resurrected to newness of life in Christ. That's what the Word of God says in multiple places, Romans 6, Galatians 2, and then there's other places that it discusses this truth, amen? But the reality of it is, is that there's still vestiges of the old man that tries to linger on. Okay, but the good news is this, is that the cross will kill it. See, that's the message of, of the true message and gospel of God is that, is that the old man has to continue to die. So there's a progression that's taking place. And when these things are connected to the desires that are contrary to the Holy Spirit, the spirit has a desire for you and I, and the flesh has its own desires. And there's a lot of different ways that this could show up. And I'm not going to get into that right now, but essentially I just want you to know that anything that is opposite of the will of God for your life is a desire of your flesh that is not a desire of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God wants to form Christ in you. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Okay. And so with that said, I want, so for instance, I want to give you a little bit of an understanding of the word lust. And this is the same word because see, lust is the desire part of the flesh. The flesh by itself, again, would just be a bag of bones laying lifeless on the ground. But now that there's a part to me that has a desire for something, so I want you to see this with this word. Look, look at James chapter 4, verse 5, if you can do that in the King James Version. James 4, 5. 
I'm trying to give you, give you a little bit of an understanding of the word lust because we started off with the graves of lust, with the graves of the flesh, if you will. And, and, and the word lust is connected to the flesh because it's the desires of the flesh that put us in a contrary position against the will of God. And so he says here in James, he says, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts? To envy. Now I want you to see that because you see, and that word lust right there, we, we really, if we looked at some other translations, they use the word desire, right? And so the word right there in the Greek, epithumia, it's not important that you remember that, but what the Greek word means, it really means a desire. It means a craving. So depending upon the context, the word can be used to describe something good or something bad. Does that make sense? So in this context, the Holy Spirit is saying that the scripture is saying the, the, that the Holy Spirit craves your attention. The Holy Spirit is craving all of you. What, what is that song that the sister sings for? He, he will, he will not, he will not relent. He, he won't relent until he has it all, right? And so, and so the Holy Spirit's not going to relent until he has all of you. He's not okay with just a little bit of you. He lusts with envy to have all of you. The Holy Spirit craves and desires to have all of your heart. He don't want just a little bit, my friend. He wants the whole thing. And he's worthy to receive the whole thing because Jesus, hallelujah, gave the whole thing. Praise God. Amen. All right. And so, look, I'm going to read to you out of the Amplified. I have that. I'll, I use it as a commentary, okay? So, but look what it says. It's good in here. James 4, 5, Amplified. They don't have that. Or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says, the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us, and he yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love? So the, so the will of God is, and that the Holy Spirit is yearning for you. He's yearning for me. He's calling for us into a closer walk with him. But the desires of the flesh, let's go back to that. I mean, you don't have to turn there if you don't want. But, but the, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. And they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And listen, let's get this clear. It's the spiritual man in you now that you've been born again that wants to do the right thing. Amen? It's not the old man. It's not the old nature. No, it's the new nature. And, and he's alive on the inside of you. And he desires to do the right yes. thing. Amen? Amen? All right. So, praise God. So... That's not my message, though. That's the end of my message. So the title of my message is this. You ready? Here's the title. You're pregnant, but are you showing? And what I want to know is, is this, is that how many women do we have in here that have had a child, right? I've got a few of them. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But let me ask you this. I was trying to imagine. I'm not in OB. Okay, I've been a pediatric practitioner for a long time. I, I, I don't remember exactly the month gestation when a woman typically, and I know it's different for different women, but is it usually somewhere around four months that you start to show and you yeah. can pretty much tell. We got some women in here that had a few kids. We can, okay, I'm getting some okays. I'm getting some affirmatives. And so about four months old, when a woman has been impregnated, she, she starts to show. And you, and you like, for the most part, you can usually tell. Sometimes you have to be careful and you don't want to just take you know, think that you know, but nevertheless, the reality of it is not four months old, you start to show. So the question tonight is not just are you, you, but us, we're pregnant, but are we showing? All right. And so the first scripture I want to bring you to is first Peter chapter one, verse 23. And I think this is the King James version right here. And, and this is what it says in 1 Peter 1 and 23. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, look, if we went further up and we went to verse 3 here and, then, and verse 2, what we would see is that, that the Father has begotten us. And in that word begotten, it literally means that he has 
fathered us and that he has given, it really and truly he's given birth to us by fathering us. So he's placed the seed of God on the inside of us. Amen. And the way that this happened was in verse 2, through the sprinkling of blood and then in verse 3, and the resurrection of the Lord. So I need to tell you that the new birth process, it takes place because of the fact that the old man, when you received Christ, in the mind of God, you were sprinkled with blood. The old man died. Amen. And a new man has been resurrected to newness of life and you received a new birth. And the seed of God moved on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And when the seed of God moved in, that means Jesus moved in. Yes. Praise God. Amen. There's multiple references in the New Testament that talk about seed. Many of these references are oftentimes directly related to the gospel. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, the sower went out to sow. And the whole idea, though, is that what he's sowing is the kingdom of God. And, and what I want you to know is this, is that in Luke 17 and 21, it says this. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So when the seed of the gospel is sown and you receive it into your heart, not only is Jesus, the kingdom of God now is on the inside of you, and the way that the kingdom of God is on the inside of you is because Christ is on the inside of you, and Christ is the king of his kingdom. Yes. Amen? And the Lord is erecting his kingdom in your heart right now, today, on this side of eternity. There's a kingdom to come that Aaron preached about on Sunday, hallelujah, and we got something to look forward to, church. Amen? But he's, he's erecting his kingdom in our heart right now, tonight, right now, today. He's building that kingdom of love, and he's trying to, he wants to do a transformation miracle on the inside of us, amen, and that we'll trust him and let Jesus grow on the inside of us. Praise God, some good things are going to happen, amen? amen. So, like a woman pregnant with a child, we have had the seed of Christ implanted in us, but are we showing yet? And again, around the fourth month of gestation, a woman starts to show. So sometimes, so at some point in time in our Christian walk, we should start to show that we are pregnant with Jesus. Am I allowed to talk like that? That means that we don't look like, talk like, act like the world around us. Now, I'm not, this is not a message of condemnation, but it is a message to speak truth. That if we've been impregnated with Jesus and if we're going through the maturation process and Jesus is growing on the inside of us, then we're going to start showing Jesus. Amen. And we're going to start looking different than the world around us because the world around us has not been impregnated with Jesus. And, and really and truly, they need us to start showing Jesus so that they'll have a desire to get impregnated with Jesus. I'm going to be preaching a, a, a message coming up soon. I know that the Lord about that Shulamite woman. And, but anyway, she, she was so fired up about her beloved. That, and the way she spoke of her beloved with, a, with the language of love, all those other maidens around her wanted to know about her beloved. And whenever you and I start to fall in love with Jesus and we allow him to grow in us, Amen. Like brother, my brother was saying at work, you know, it, it was sometimes about when we leave the aroma of Jesus. Amen. And there's a lot we can say about that. But in order for the fetus to grow in the uterus, it depends on the mother's nutrition. Does that make sense? Her nutrition is broken down into macro and micronutrients. I'm not trying to get too fancy. What are macros? Carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. What are micros? There's tons of vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, selenium, minerals. You get the point. If you eat, it breaks down. It goes into the bloodstream. A woman that's pregnant has an, or the umbilical cord is connected to the baby. All those micronutrients absorb into the blood, goes into the baby's body, and the baby starts to grow. The nutrition causes the baby to grow. First Peter chapter two, verse two. This is Peter, the apostle. And he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And you know, sometimes as a preacher, as I'm writing, I feel like I hear people in the audience. Huh? I'm not a milk drinker. I'm a meat eater. Right. But this different context than when the apostle Paul 
talked to the Corinthian church. And he said, oh, he said, you're carnal. I wish you were spiritual. If you would have been spiritual, I could have fed you meat. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 3. He said, I, I would have fed you meat, but you're not spiritual. You're carnal, so i got to give you milk still. But that's a different context. This context is that just like a baby craves milk for growth, so should the believer crave the sincere, and I want to point out that word right there, the sincere milk of the word. Amen. See, and, and so look, you, you get at some point in time, the adult believer has to, we do, we have to get to the place where we start to consume the meat of the word. You know, you can't be college age and still eating a third grade lunchable, amen, and, and expect to be growing in Christ, if that makes sense, right? Also, if something is wrong with the nutrition of the mom, okay, or if, or if the cord is twisted, okay, then there's a lack of nutritional flow to the fetus, therefore the fetus will not grow properly. There's a term for it, and I used to say it a lot, but I'm not going to really get into all that. But there's a term when a fetus doesn't grow properly. And spiritually, the, the, the fetus will not grow, and spiritually, the Christian will not show. Okay? And, and so, so you, you can be pregnant with Jesus, born again, but not necessarily showing Jesus. And so what would cause this, and I just put a couple of little comments here. Maybe we're still eating spiritual lunchables. That's a possibility. I'm talking about people in the faith. I'm not saying you necessarily, but I'm saying that, listen, sometimes people never grow in, in the depth or the digging for the treasure of who Christ is. What Christ has done, and there, you know, I could get into that a lot, but let's just keep moving. So, or you're eating something that looks like the Word, but it isn't. And and listen, let me say this: I'm not even talking about the Bible right now. I'm talking about Christ. I'm, yes, yes, you're going to learn it through the Bible, but I'm not talking about just sitting there putting your eyes in front of the Bible and and just going through the rote motions of reading Bible, I'm talking about allowing the nutrition of who Christ is and what Christ has done get into your heart and have its way on the inside of you and nourish you and teach you to and allow Christ to grow in you. Now look, Peter said this, he said a baby craves milk for growth, right? And then he used this word sincere. Now, I want you to I want you to know something about that word sincere. This is pretty to me this is pretty important. This is what the word means. Unmixed, unadulterated, pure. Unmixed, unadulterated, pure. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but many of you know the word that the Lord gave to me. When I was reading that many years ago, whenever I was in that barroom bathroom and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, Present my word for the way that it is written. Unmixed, unadulterated, and pure. I'll tell you another thing that one time happened to me, and you may not be able to relate to this, okay? And I don't want to give you the wrong impression of God, but, but God has spoken to me like this a couple of times. And, and I don't, you, he may not, have, not and maybe he's never spoken to you like this. And, and, and that would be great too if he didn't, but he spoke to me specifically one time. And he said, I need men to keep their grubby fingers out of my word. Now, what does that even mean? Well, I can remember one time uh, whenever my sister lived in the house you lived in, Mom, before they moved into the big house, and I can remember being out there in the front yard digging around in the dirt, and there was a grub worm. I was digging for grub worms, and my fingers were all dirty, and I had fingers. See, man tries to mess with God's word. And you got to understand, this is going on. This is very, very prevalent in the church. I would not talk to you about this thing if I didn't think it was important. I need you to understand that there's a whole system in the church world where men have learned through the traditions of their fathers that have gone before them to present a word that is pleasant to the hearers. We are in that prophetic word that was spoken to Timothy that said in the last days men will heap to themselves preachers because they have ears that they want to hear pleasant words and I'm telling you I done went to the schools I heard the tactics I saw the way that we're going to 
do church. We're doing church together, folks. We're doing life together. And we present a word in such a way that it's palatable for you. That it allows you to continue to live your American dream. And I'm here to tell you right now, friends, that the word of God brings death to these, some of these things that we're talking about. And the true word is going to do that. All right. Amen. That's just the truth. Amen. So he wants, see, the Lord wants an unmixed, unadulterated, pure milk of the word. And then we'll grow by that. Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. I want you to see this in the King James Version. The Apostle Paul writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He, sa he says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. I want you to see that. Now let, let's just stop. I don't know what you're doing right now. If you're looking at your Bible, praise God. But, let, but let's just look at this. Let's look at this a little more closely. Look at what it says. If he comes preaching another Jesus. Now you got to understand this. That means that people can have Jesus in their message but they're actually preaching a different Jesus. I'm not talking about the Mormons. I'm not talking about Jesus and Lucifer, brothers. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they're preaching a message and it has the name of Jesus in it, okay, that, that Paul didn't preach. And I'm going to get to that. Let me just tell you this. The, the true Jesus is the Jesus of the cross. Let me just go ahead and say this right now. The true Christ is the Christ of the cross. You can't have the real Christ without the cross because the real gospel is going to cause a crucifixion to your flesh. Yeah, yeah. The real word of God is going to slay the old man and all of its vestiges and all of its remaining parts that are trying to hold on to you, the ways of the world that are trying to hold on to you. And I'm not talking about smoking something. I'm not talking about drinking something no more. I'm talking about all that stuff on the inside of our heart. All that malice, all that anger, all that slander, all those things that are different than our Jesus. Yeah. Amen. This is a message of love, my friend. The Holy Spirit was to form Jesus on the inside of your heart. The message of the truth of God's word wants to free you so that you can serve him in spirit and in truth yeah. to worship him. That's what God wants. Hallelujah. But there's another Jesus out there and they're pre and it's got a spirit connected to it. But look, if it's another Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. That, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. That, that means, you know, do you realize that people get stuck in, do you realize people get stuck in religion and they can't get free? Yes, yes. They can't get free. And I'm not just talking about Catholicism either. Yes. Visiting a church near you soon. Okay, I'm just saying. And they can't get up and get out. That's right. Come on. Because they're being held in bondage yep. by spirits, but it's not the Holy Spirit. And they think that they're in the right thing. And listen to me. We're all men and women. We're humans. And we're, we're learning Christ. So none of us have it figured out. Right. But I'm here to tell you right now. If, you're, if somebody's preaching a Christ without a cross. And I'm not talking about they said the word cross. I didn't have people. I've been preaching for a little while now. And I don't have people. Well, you keep saying that they don't preach the cross. But he said cross three times. That's not preaching the cross. I could preach for an hour and a half and never say the word cross one time. Listen, the truth of God's word, again, what I'm trying to tell you, it's going to cause death to my flesh and it's going to cause life to Christ. It's going to cause Christ to be formed in me. Amen. And it's going to, it's going to do a change on the inside of me is what I'm trying to say. So listen, it's not only another Jesus with a different spirit, but it's a completely different gospel and people are putting up with it. I'm here to tell you that it's prevalent. Yep. It is very, very, listen, I'm going to try to explain it to you a little bit better, but I didn't really plan on this. I didn't have it in my notes, but, and it's not important who I used to talk about the name all the time, but that's not important. Back in the eighties, 
they went knocking on doors in Saddleback, California, and they literally went to the community and they said, what can we do for the church service to make it more palatable for you, to where you will feel more comfortable in our services? And they said different things, like, man, get rid of the choir robes, lame. You can maybe maybe dim the lights a little bit, right? And, you know, and, and so before you know it, it shorten the service up a little bit, man. You kind of keeping me there too long. And all of the and so they literally knocked and I'm telling you, I didn't just dream this up. I read the book by the person that said they did it. Okay? They knocked on the doors, they went to the world. They went to the world and they asked the world, what can we do to make it more comfortable for you? Okay, so that's never been the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is where the fivefold ministry would equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. The purpose of the church is for you to be built up to allow Christ to be formed in you. And then you take Christ outside the walls of the church and you share the good news of Jesus and what he's done for you with those that are lost out there. But now we've created an environment for where people can feel comfortable and never be challenged in their walk with God. Because if we start challenging you, it might offend you if you don't know the difference between conviction and condemnation. And if you start feeling uncomfortable, like, man, that preacher's just making me feel all uncomfortable. And I don't, I don't really want to go, well, hold on a second. The, the, the Word of God talks about a Holy Spirit conviction. How would you and I know that we're not that something's not right if we never get into the word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit never pricks our heart and lets us know that something's not right in our life? Okay. So the Lord wants unmixed, unadulterated, and pure word of God. Amen. You know, a lot most of the time, you can go to Galatians 4:17. But most of the time, whenever somebody is a false teacher, if they're teaching another Jesus, most of the time they're not even doing it on purpose. Yeah, y'all understand what I'm trying to say? Most of the time they're not preaching a gospel that's not right on purpose. Most of the time they are just following in the footsteps of those that taught them the things that they teach. And they, and they didn't really go to the word and really dig it out. To see for themselves. And, and, and I mean, I know you got to kind of like just trust me on that. Um, but I mean, you don't have to trust me. But look, but I want you to see this is what happens. So false teaching affects the growth of believe in believers. They look at, look at the scripture, Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. You know what he's saying right here? He's saying they have a zeal to to connect to you. They have a zeal to teach you something. They're zealous to affect, but, but what they're doing is going to exclude you. Now, specifically, what was going on here in the Galatian church was they were trying to add something to Jesus. They were saying, you got Jesus, but now you got to get circumcised in order to be really righteous in the eyes of God. But listen, people ain't going around teaching circumcision anymore, but they're teaching a whole plethora of other things that they're trying to add to Jesus, trying to add to his work. And I'm here to tell you that if we're not careful, we get caught up under a spirit of religion and, and we're traveling in a road in some of these churches. Then, and then you got to figure out for yourself whether, you know, whether, whether people are in the right church or whatever the case, whether you're in the right church, you need to figure that out for yourself. But I can tell you one thing, whenever the longer somebody travels in a church like that, the more they get used to that landscape, the more they get used to this is the way we do church. And here people are traveling on another road. It's a biblical church that's sticking to what the word of God says. And, the, and they get used to that landscape. And I'm telling you right now, somebody makes a hard left and cuts through the field because them two roads are not coming together. They're moving further and further apart. And if somebody takes a left and cuts through that field and ends up in a church that's biblical and they've been in something else for a long time, it's almost like it sounds like a different language. Yes. But the scripture teaches what I'm trying to explain. And he says, he says, he says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Now look at verse 19 right there. He says this, my little children of whom I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. The apostle Paul is, he, he's, he's grieved in his spirit. You, you know, people talk all the time, man. You ought to not talk about other other preachers, but he's talking about other preachers. He's saying those people that are coming to you and trying to add to Christ, 
They zealously are affecting you, but not for the good. They're trying to exclude you is what they're trying to do. And, and, and he's saying right here, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm grieved, my little children. I'm like I'm in labor pains uh, until Christ be formed in you. So, so the true word of God is going to form Jesus on the inside of you. Amen. Praise God. Look, I had a Bible professor when I was working in my, on my Bible degree. And uh, his name was John Wyckoff. He was a German, right? And he was a true scholar. And everybody avoided him. Everybody that I knew avoided him. He, he would mostly teach him like this. Most of what he taught was like the Paul, Paul's letters, Ephesians and Romans. Dude, every single semester I tried to make sure I had a class with this guy. This is where I was living, right? But I'll never forget that he made a comment in one of his teachings. And he said this, it doesn't really matter whether somebody preaches the gospel in error on accident or on purpose. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter if they're preaching the Bible in error. It doesn't matter whether they're doing it on accident or on purpose. It results in the same thing. It results in bondage instead of freedom. See, the truth of God's word is going to result in freedom, amen, because it allows Christ to be uh, formed in you, amen? Praise God. You know, it's in this story that we're talking about, these men are coming in and they're trying to convince these Galatians to be circumcised. But, you know, a person... And I said this earlier that a lot of times these guys, they serve, they're serving the Lord with their lives. I mean, think about that. I mean, you, you may know a preacher that moved from a whole other town, you're right? Moved from a whole other town, maybe from North Louisiana, maybe from another state to take a job somewhere, brought, packed up their family and moved them all the way to another state. And I mean, these people, these people love God. I mean, right? I mean, I, would I mean, maybe that's not a proof that they all love God. But my point is, most of these people really love the Lord. And they really desire to serve God. But, but if they have packed up their whole family, as good as that looks, but they're not preaching the Christ of the cross or the cross of the Christ, and they're not preaching a message that is allowing Christ to be formed, it doesn't really matter how how good their motives may be or it may look like their motives are good, they're not doing what God has asked them to do. You know, there's been times uh, that I realized I was wrong. I, I, like, in other words, and I've admitted it by the grace of God. There's been times I thought I was right, but then I realized I was wrong. And, and the Holy Spirit wanted me to admit that. Okay, um, but the question is, w w will a person admit that they're wrong and, and, and ask God to help them stop being wrong once they realize that they're wrong? If, if it's going to make them vulnerable to worldly loss, in other words, if you're going to upset some people, are you willing to do that instead of upsetting the Holy Spirit? Let me go ahead and word that a different way. Are people only going to preach a message with the hearers in mind, or are people going to preach a message with the Holy Spirit in mind? Are they going to prepare a message that they feel like the, that the hearers need to hear or want to hear? Look, I went to a preaching conference one time, way back in the day when I was working on my, and I went with a pastor, and we were sitting in the class, and what the, what the guy said, it was a famous, famous Fancy word, homiletician, a presenter of the word. Okay, is what it means. That's what an orator. Okay, he was the famous guy. Wrote a book about it, and and he said this. He said, if you have not touched their felt needs in the first twenty minutes, you've lost them. And you know what that means? That means that whatever you feel you need. If I, as a preacher, have not touched you with where you feel like you need to be touched in the first twenty minutes, then I've lost you. And I remember I reached over there to the pastor I was with, and I was like, do you have a problem with that? Like, it grieved my spirit. It's like, no, nah, I, think I think he's right on that. So what they're telling me, and now listen, you got to understand something. This has been going on for years. This is, what they're, this is what they're pumping out of Bible colleges. 
Do, do you understand that? This is, this is the system of what they're pumping out of Bible colleges that, that you are, need to touch their felt needs. You, present, you prepare a message that you feel like the hearer wants to hear. And now you're going to make them feel as though you're, you're touching their felt needs. This is relevant for me. What this guy is saying is a relevant, practical message that can help me. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with practical messages, but what I'm trying to tell you, what the Lord wants to do is he wants to kill your old man and he yeah. wants to resurrect and form Christ yeah. on the inside of you, amen, right. and teach you how to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can be your pastor, amen, so that you can get along with the Lord and in an intimate relationship with him, he will speak to you, yeah. he will lead yeah. you, he will yeah. guide you in all truth. That's yeah. what yeah. The, the gospel does. Yeah. It gives you a personal, intimate, relationship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It goes on to say in, in Galatians 6, 12, but I'm not going to belabor the point. It says, those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. You know, people sometimes want us to follow their teachings, their doctrines. No, 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 no. We're going to, we need to follow the teachings and the doctrines of the scripture. But then he goes on to say this, and I used this scripture recently, Galatians 6, 14, but, but, be it far, be, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I unto the world. Now, I do think that this is interesting, and I'm kind of getting close to the end. So let's take a look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 3. It says that there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So look, I just want to just kind of like you, I just want to talk a little bit with you. We'll calm down and try to talk to you a little bit. So this is about probably 60 AD, something like that, that Peter writes this letter, 60 AD. So close to 2,000 years ago, right? About 2,000 years ago. And he's saying that there's, there were false prophets among the people, Okay, and that there would be false teachers among you. Do you do you think that that went away? <laughs> like in the last two thousand years, and now we're. In, I mean, does that, does most people do most people agree that we're in the last days? That as the days are growing darker. So, would you expect that false teachers would increase, or do you expect that false teachers would would decrease? I mean, see, for me, the logical thought process is that. False teachers would increase. That's what that's what I would think. So anyway, he says this about these false teachers. False teachers among you who privily, that word could be just could secretly bring in damnable heresies. Now I want I want to show you something. And even denying the Lord that bought them. Now hold on. So you're saying, yeah, I've sat in some churches before where I kind of feel like maybe. And we're not here to, to beat up any other church. That's not the point here. What we're trying to do is to give us a clear roadmap on what the right place looks like. That's what we're here for, okay? Uh, and so that we so that we can and so that we can not get caught up in a mess, and so we can pray for our loved ones or pray for people. Okay. And so what I want you to see here is this: is that denying the Lord that bought them now. So people would say, yeah, I've been in churches like that before where I questioned what was being said, but they didn't deny Jesus. They definitely didn't deny Jesus. Okay, y'all get y'all following me on see. But what I want you to know is I broke this, I found, I, I studied this word out. This is what it actually says. It doesn't mean that they said, oh, Jesus didn't do it. It doesn't mean that they said, oh, Jesus didn't buy me with his blood. This is what it means to contradict or disregard the interests of. So what, what it means is that they're denying the truth of the scripture about Jesus. They're denying or they're contradicting with their teaching the truth about Jesus. It doesn't mean that they don't still have the name of Jesus in their message. It means that they're teaching a different Jesus and they're teaching a different way or, or a different way about Jesus that contradicts the truth of the scripture. Now, I don't know about you, but, but that's kind of sobering for me. It says, and it will bring swift destruction on themselves. But, but look, look at the word, look at verse three. And through covetousness, 
They shall with feigned words, fake words, covetousness. You know, you know there's a whole gospel out there that pr promotes covetousness in people. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? There's a whole gospel out there where the whole emphasis is on he who dies with the most yeah. toys wins in the end. He who, well, man, look, that, is, that, that message will not preach in India, my friend. That message will not preach in China as they're hiding under their houses, yep. sharing Jesus with one another, hoping that they don't get caught and that they get killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. That, that message only flies in America with the prosperity gospel. Does God prosper his people? Absolutely. Are you happy you were born in America? Amen. Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay, but let's not get confused between what the gospel really is or what it is not. But look, he said, with fake or feigned words, they will make merchandise of you. Look, I looked up that word merchandise just to do it. The word was plastos. And so I'm pretty sure where we get the word plastic from. So, so like basically whenever we sit under this type of teaching or humans sit under this type of teaching, it makes it makes us like a plastic image of something like we're just not even something that's real. So we're not even becoming real disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus can never be formed on the inside of that. Now, I'm going back to Kibroth Hatava. All right. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11. Verses 18 through 20, because look, what, we're, what the emphasis of my message really was on had to do with Christ being formed in you, had to do with you and I becoming impregnated with the seed of God and having to do with the truth of God's word, allowing Christ to grow in us, amen, to the point where we begin to show Jesus and then the dangers that an improper presentation of the gospel, if we connect ourselves to that, will prevent us from growing. Just like a, a, a kinked umbilical cord would prevent proper nutrition from going to the fetus, and improper spiritual nutrition would prevent us from growing in Christ. All right, so now we're back to the concept of flesh, at least in the Old Testament. So it said in, a, in verse a, chapter 11, verses 18 through 20, and say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourself against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. And you shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and it be loathsome unto you because that you have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? Now listen, I want, I want to just kind of like try to make a little point here. God was providing them with what he knew was good for them. Do you understand that? He was giving them the provision of the manna from heaven and he was providing them with what they needed to be nourished so that they could grow into what he desired for them to be. And that they looked backwards because Egypt is a type of the world. And they looked backwards to their old life and they kind of missed their old life. And instead of, they became loathsome with the bread that God was giving them and they wanted something different. And this goes back to the desires of our flesh, the desires of our old life, the desires of our old man, or the desire to have something in addition to Jesus, or the desire to have a different kind of Jesus that allows me to continue to live the way that I want to live. Because see, that's what the desires of the flesh are. They're what I want and not what God wants. The Spirit of God has a will for my life and a plan for my life, but the flesh has a different plan for my life. Okay, and so he said, he said, and, and you know, what I want to say is this, is that God, God allows people to, to go after the flesh. He's not going to stop you. This is where the free will of man comes into the picture. God is not going, now that doesn't mean that you're going to automatically go to hell. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that you will open up the door to feed your flesh 
And the next thing you know, you thought that it was just going to be like a little vacation that you was going to take. But the reality of it is, is that you had to stay a whole lot longer than what you planned. Has anybody ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but has anybody ever done that before? I got to tell you something. As a, If I'm going to be an honest preacher to you, that's happened to me more than once. Where, where I thought I was just going to take a little peek around the corner and nibble on a little bit of flesh. And it did not turn out that way. It was, the Lord said it ain't going to be one day, two days. No, it's going to be a month. You're going to eat this stuff for a whole month. You think that's what you want? Well, you're going to start eating on it for quite some time till it becomes loathsome to you. Now, i got to tell you something that most of you in here that I saw you shake your head yes, that you had also done what I had done in the past. I think we can all also admit with, to one another that there came a place where it became loathsome to us. That the decisions that we had made that, that, that it was no longer it was no longer fun and we needed deliverance from it. We started crying out to the Lord, Lord, please forgive me. Amen. This this is not going the way that I expected it to go. You know, one of the things that we learned from the Gospel of John in chapter six is that this manna actually was Jesus. Jesus tells us that, right? Yeah. He said, Moses didn't give you that manna from heaven. That's right. My father gave you this manna from heaven, and this is the bread of life. That takes away the, the sin of the world. And then he said, then he goes on. I thought this was interesting today. And I mean, I haven't had enough time to really chew on it. Uh, no pun intended. I haven't had time to chew on it because they were chewing on the flesh. Right? And, but, but, but what I'm saying is this, is that Jesus said, and the bread that I will give you is my flesh. So the story is directly related to the, to the Moses incident with the manna from heaven. And they wanted flesh. And God had some flesh for the human race, but they were demanding the wrong kind of flesh. And then Jesus comes up there and he says, the, 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 the bread of life is actually my flesh. But then he goes on to explain later that it's the spirit that gives life, right? So we learned that, that, that this free will is connected to this. Uh, and, and so, you know, this flesh could be anything. You know, I don't want to live my life this way. I want to live my life that way. I don't want to go to this church. I want to go to that church. Or I don't want to go to church. It does, you know, look, you, there may be a day when the Lord calls you to a different church. I'm just saying that happens. But there's a lot of times people leave in the flesh because it's what they don't want. See, and if you and I leave in the flesh because it's what we don't want, but yet it was against God's will, then now we're outside of God's will. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I don't want to, I, don't, I, want, I want to marry this kind of man, not that kind of man, and vice versa, right, with the woman. I, I want this kind of job, not that kind of job. I want a new house, a new car, a new boat, a new toy. I want to live the American dream. And I'm not trying to say that any of those are wrong if it's God's will. And not our own will. The problem comes in whenever it's our will instead of God's will. Okay? So now let's take a look at Numbers 11. And singers, musicians, y'all can come up. Numbers 11, verse 33 through 34. It says right here in verse 33, And while the flesh was yet between their teeth. I don't know why, but this is something in the King James. Ere it was chewed. E-R-E. Isn't that something? That's an old outdated word. I looked it up on my little dictionary. It means before in time. Before they even had time to chew it. They put it in their mouth. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatavah. Because they buried the people that lusted. They lusted. In their flesh, God was providing manna, but they wanted flesh. An ongoing diet of flesh is a spiritual diet of poor nutrition choices. This will result in a slowing of Christ being formed in you. And again, the question was, we're pregnant, but are we showing? And if we're not showing, is it possibly connected to the diet that we've been eating? And so I want to encourage you, amen, to let's pray. Let's pray real quick. Let's just stand up. Y'all start playing softly a little bit. Just kind of